As always, it is great to be here with you this morning. There's a little bit of feel of spring in the air. There's a little bit of flowers popping up through the dirt. It's coming. The most beautiful time of year in western Kentucky, in my own opinion. Last week, we started by looking back. And if you remember, I asked the question, who were you? I asked you to think back of who you were before you were found in Christ. And that is a state in which Peter reminds those who he's writing to, those who he says who have obtained equal faith as of theirs, the theirs being the apostles in 2 Peter chapter 1. But he says you were drawn out of or you were taken out of this life of sin, of desires, of passions. And we think about who we were. But it's interesting to me as we look at the book of 2 Peter, Peter seems to bookend the idea of who you were in chapter 1 with the scripture that was just read in 2 Peter chapter 3 about who you're going to be or what you're waiting for. I like to draw your attention back to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, therefore, beloved, verse 14, since you are waiting for these, well, the these being found back up in verse 13, he says, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which the righteousness dwells. We're waiting for that glorious day where we're caught up in the air and we have this eternal home in heaven. And we sing these songs and we prepare ourselves mentally for a great home over yonder. Can you think about heaven without smiling? I just, I I can't understand all of how great it will be. But every Sunday morning when we sing, I believe I have a glimpse of what it's going to be like. We sang Prince of Peace here a minute ago. You are holy. And I sat there, or I stood there, I think we were standing, in that pew, and I went, man, this is awesome. And one day I get to do it before my father. I don't know what streets of gold will be like. I've never seen them. But I know what it sounds like when I'm gathered around a bunch of his people and singing. And how awesome that's going to be. And as I look at Second Peter, Peter seems to be pouring out his heart in all the realness that Peter is. He draws their attention and says, you were drawn out of this corruption. And only through Christ, and let me reiterate that, only through Christ do we have salvation. But he says, this world's tough. And there's going to be those who are going to come in and present false teaching. Satan is going to try to destroy you. And Peter, in a sense, is looking at those who he's writing to and saying, it's hard. And I believe looking at Peter's life, if you look at the life of Peter through the Gospels, Peter has every right to look at those those readers and say, it's hard. The same man who sat there with Christ and said, I will not deny you, yet denied him three times. The same man who would not submit to the will of Christ to go humbly to the cross as he drew his sword. Trying to stop the death of our Savior. But Peter in 2 Peter writes this this book, this letter, with a great sense of encouragement. Not only do we look back at who we used to be, but let us rejoice in where we're going. This new heavens and this new earth. This place where I'll be caught up in. So three times in doing that, he makes this charge. He says, make every effort in 1 Peter chapter, or 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. 
He says, be diligent. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. And in the text we just read that Levi did such a great job reading. In chapter 3 and verse 14, he says, be all the more diligent. Because Peter understands. Peter gets this life is tough. This week has been tough. Next week will be tough. And Satan hates the fact that you're here this morning with your Bible open. Therefore, he wants to do everything he can to destroy you. He doesn't like the fact that you start your day with prayer. He doesn't like the fact that you strive to talk about biblical things. He hates it. Therefore, he's going to do everything within his ability to try to destroy you, to try to make your week harder. But we know that our God is more powerful, that our God is stronger, and that the blood of Christ is more powerful than him. So we make every effort. And we get up every day trying to supplement our faith. So he says we make our calling and election sure. And so that we will not fall, therefore we will continue looking forward to that new heavens and that new earth. Church, that's something to rejoice about. That's something to be excited about because we can understand that all of us are in the same boat trying to make it to the same place and it's tough. And that's the reality, guys. Therefore, he says, be diligent. Make every effort to supplement your faith. I've given you all the things that you need. I've given you my son. I've given you my spirit. But he says, every day, wake up. Make every effort to supplement your faith. And we talked about the first three last week. Supplement your faith with moral excellence. Supplement your faith, as he continues reading in verse 5, with knowledge. Supplement your faith with self-control. And each of these items seem to be building off the previous one. As if you're building this castle, this fortified city, where we cannot be affected by the sin of the world. He says, make every effort to supplement your faith. Supplement your faith with moral excellence. Supplement your faith with knowledge. Supplement your faith with self-control. And he begins as we begin this week. Supplement your faith with steadfastness. You ever think about what that idea means? I believe Thayer's puts it in the best way for me to understand. And it's written this way. Steadfastness is the characteristic of a man who is unswerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest or be it by even among the greatest trials and sufferings. And I focus in on that word that every time I type it in my computer, the red squiggly lines show up underneath as if I'm misspelling it, but the word is unswerved. I'm steadfast, meaning I am, I am founded and nothing in this world is going to come and take me by deceit. Uh, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and he says this. He says, you don't be caught up in every wind or rave of every doctrine, deceitful schemes of man, but you are to main stand firm or steadfast, standing firm in what you believe. Are we that rooted in the knowledge that we talked about last week in the belief in our faith in God to remain steadfast that no matter what wind blows, we don't chase it? Unfortunately, in our world today, I believe we have a lot of tumbleweed Christians. If you've ever been out west, you've seen a tumbleweed. I remember I hit a tumbleweed one time, and I think there was pieces of the tumbleweed in the front of my car for the rest of that car's life. But if you've ever seen a tumbleweed, a tumbleweed will roll with the wind until when? Until it hits something that makes it stop, i.e., a fence. 
And in certain places, I know in New Mexico, in Texas, I think there's even places in Colorado, that you will drive along a fence line, and there's just tons of tumbleweeds that have been blown that way. Are you that way in your Christianity, that any new idea, whether it's true or whether it's not, whether it's Bible or whether it's not, you follow it like that tumbleweed or you're pushed by it? Because there's a lot of new ideas that come out every day that want to distract us from the truth. But you see, if I go back in some of those other supplements, those things that are allowing me to grow, knowledge is one of those supplements that allows me to remain firm in what I believe, the truth of the gospel. I'm not going to swerve back and forth. So how do I do that? I think Paul hit it on the head when he talked about those who run a race. And I think about a marathon runner. I'm not a marathon runner by any means. I'm not sure those who run marathons have sanity. You know who you are. But you ever think about the discipline, the steadfastness a marathon runner has to have? If you've ever ran a distance, there comes a point when you run a long ways that if you're not running towards a goal, there's no reason to run. You understand what I'm saying? Like if you cannot understand where your goal is and where you're going, why in the world am I running in the first place? Some of you may say the only reason I run is if something is chasing you. That's a goal to get away from whatever is chasing you. You still have a goal. Nobody runs without a goal. And because you have a goal, a marathon runner will maintain a course. And that course leads where? The finish line. And that marathon runner is not swerving to the right or swerving to the left, exerting other energy or extra energy because that marathon runner is continually running in the same course towards that same goal. Church, are you running towards the goal of heaven? Or are you swerving all over the place? Every time a new idea in the religious world comes out, you grab at it, and now you've taken yourself further and further away from the truth of the gospel. Peter says, supplement your faith. Make every effort to supplement your faith with steadfastness. We do that by maintaining a marathon runner's frame of mind. And that is finding the goal and getting after it. He continues on. He says this, supplement your faith with godliness. It's a big word that we talk about a lot. And I think it was in the theological dictionary of the New Testament. It said this and it said a lot, but there was a phrase that it said that I really held on to. It said, really, the meaning of this word is this. God nearness. That's an interesting idea, right? And we may think it's something we take for granted, godliness. The idea of having God near. Is God near in our thoughts, in our mind? A presence of mind where God is always near and on the forefront of our mind and thoughts. Godliness. God nearness. Meaning I'm going to live my life and I want, I desire God to be close to me. I'm not sure I always want that. Because maybe there are things that I do that I become ashamed of. And I don't want God near me in those moments. Maybe there are things that I say, thoughts that I have that are not what God wants. But yet, I should supplement my faith with this God nearness, a facing every day with a humble head and reverence to God's plan. Godliness. I asked Dan this week, I said, Explain godliness to me, and he told me this. He said, there's Sermon on the Mount. 
You want to know how to be godly? Read the Sermon on the Mount. Read about our anger. Read about when he says, you have heard it was said, but I say to you, and he covers a gamut of ways to be godly, doesn't he? About anger, about lust, about adultery, about our yeses being our yeses and our noes being noes. He continues on and says, do not do things to be seen by men, but to do things to be seen by God. That's godliness. He tells us how to pray. That's godliness. He tells us all of these things to do, to fast, not to be seen by men. He tells us not to be worrying or anxious about tomorrow. Why? Because God will take care of you. He tells us to seek first the kingdom of God. He tells us to what? How to love. How to treat one another. You want to know how to be godly? You want to know how to live a God near life? We read the Sermon on the Mount. But I think so many times we may look at a word like godliness and we may take it for granted. We may, we may assume we just are. But let me ask you, have you prayed recently for God to be near in your thoughts? God, allow my thoughts to be your thoughts. Allow my thoughts to be thoughts that are glorifying of you. Allow my actions to be actions that glorify you. Father, please allow me to seek first your rule in my life. Peter says, supplement your faith with godliness. He continues on and he gives us the last two. And I know these kind of overlap and I want them to in my thinking the way I see this. He says, supplement your faith with brotherly affection. The ESV uses brotherly affection. Whatever your English rendering is, the word here is Philadelphia. And we all, you know, I don't use a lot of Greek words, but that's one we all know, right? We know that because of the city in Pennsylvania. And what is the motto of the city in Pennsylvania? It is Philadelphia, the city of, we know that one. But do you think Peter has a little experience about this concept of brotherly affection and the following word, which is agape? We all know where I'm going, right? Peter has this, um, I don't know what, what you'd call it, but I believe Peter, it hits a nerve with Peter. Because remember what happened in John chapter 21? Remember the question that Christ asked him? Do you love me? And we know you've heard this before. I'm not telling you anything new. But for those of you who haven't heard it, or those of you who heard, just endure me for a minute. Uh, but Christ says, Peter, remember Peter, uh, or Christ comes back and they're fishing and he says, do you love me more than these? Talking about the fish, talking about his profession that he's going back to. And he comes back and Christ says, Peter, do you love me? In that phrase, in the question that Christ is asking, Christ is asking Peter, do you love me in a self-sacrificing way, Peter? Are you willing to give up self for me, Peter? And we know that Peter responds in this phileo type way yeah you're my buddy and when you say it that way it sounds really strange doesn't it yeah sure I love you I think a lot of people still love Christ that way you know how I know that because we have shirts in production that say Jesus is my homeboy. No, he's not. But maybe that's how we love Christ. He's just my buddy. When I need him, he's there. If I need to move a couch, he's always there. Right? We have friends that way, don't we? Peter seems to have this, this idea 
that he really wants to make this point that we are to supplement our faith with something more than just this brotherly affection. Yes, brotherly affection is important. And we have this kindness and this gentleness and this caring nature amongst us. But he says, I need you to really grow in your love to one another. I'm going to say that one more time. I need you to really grow in the way you love one another. Do you believe that you have a self-sacrificing love for the church? What does that look like? I believe a self-sacrificing love says I'm going to give each other the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to be eager to forgive and willing to forget. A self-sacrificing love says I'm willing to do for you anytime, any place, just say the words. A self-sacrificing love we understand in John chapter 15 when he explained his love to his apostles was what? That he was willing to do what? Lay down his life for them. See, this is an intimate topic for Peter. Because Peter didn't quite understand it. It's funny because if you go back into 1 Peter, he does it again in chapter 1. of 1 Peter chapter 1. And look at verse 22. He says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. That's our Philadelphia word. But he says what? The very next word, love, that's our word agape. One another from an earnest and pure heart. He's making a distinction. And I know some people say, well, you shouldn't make a distinction. Well, Peter does. Christ did. Supplement your faith with this self-sacrificing love. Not only should we have a self-sacrificing love for the church, but we should have a self-sacrificing love for God in Christ. For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's not about me anymore. It's never been about me. I almost sounded like Seinfeld just then. My voice got real high. But I'm to supplement my faith not only with brotherly affection, but I'm to supplement my faith with love, a self-sacrificing love. Are you supplementing your faith? Are you making every effort to add these things to your faith? Moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. Every day. Every day. If you continue reading in the text, he says this. He says in verse 8, if these qualities, listen to me, are yours and are increasing. Sounds like a little bit of ownership, doesn't it? They're mine. They're who I am. It's not something I do, but it's who I am. I make every effort every day, every second of every day to supplement my faith so I can make sure of my calling and election. So I am fruitful, he says. And then continuing down into verse 10, he says, so I will not fall. Every day. Every day I will make every effort. I will be all the more diligent to supplement my faith. To add to my faith these qualities. He says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, verse 8, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind. Having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. There he is looking back again. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. I look back at who I was before Christ. I don't like that guy. But because of the great love of God and because of the blood of Christ, I'm not that guy anymore. And right now, I look forward to that one day when I hear the words that I long to hear for the rest of my life, well done, thy good and thy faithful servant. But there's a span of my life in between those two points. And in that span, I am to make every effort to supplement my faith so I will not fall. I will beat the devil through the blood of Christ. Through his love and through his guidance, I will carry on my life. And one day I will be like Paul when he says, I have fought the fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Therefore, there is a crown of righteousness laid by in store for me. But not only for me only, he says, but for all who loved his appearing. I hope we can be active in our faith. I hope we can be diligent to make every effort to supplement our faith so we will not fall. I love 2 Peter, and we're going to continue on next week as we move through the book. Let's pray. God Almighty, we are so thankful for your Son. We know without Him we're nothing. Father, we're so thankful that you gave Him to die on the cross for our sins. We're so thankful for the opportunity that each of us have to be your children. Father, help us every day to be diligent, to make every effort to supplement our faith with these qualities that you give us. Help us to work on them. Help us to strengthen ourselves in them, knowing that your spirit is strong and he's working through us. Father, give us a contagious attitude around those who are around us. Father, we're so thankful to be called your children. We're thankful we're not who we used to be outside of you. And we look forward to who we are going to be one day in that heavenly home. Father, we pray all these things through your son. Amen. I have a question for you as we close. Are you in Christ? As we understand, 2 Peter is writing or Peter is writing in 2 Peter to those who have obtained a faith equal to this, to the, to the apostles. Are you in Christ this morning? Have you decided to make a conscious, knowledgeable choice to be in Christ? Have you said, I will sacrifice self, I will die to self to live for him? Do you realize how awesome God is and how great his son is. Are you in Christ this morning? You may be sitting here this morning thinking, what is he talking about? Let's study. I want to tell you all about what it means to be in Christ. And I know there's a bunch of other people in this room that would be chomping at the bit to tell you too. Right, Mark? Let's do it. Let's tell you. If you're sitting here right now and you don't understand what it means to be in Christ, let's study. Let's talk about it. My prayer for each of us this week is that we go into this world and we make every effort every day to supplement our faith. If you need to respond, the invitation is always given by God. A call to any lost soul to come to him. Now is the time to do that. If you need to ask for forgiveness of this congregation or you need prayers of this congregation, maybe you're struggling with something. Maybe your faith is weak and you need the strength. Whatever your need may be, now is the time. But together we stand and we sing the song that's been selected.